Last time out, I discussed the cost of public DC rapid charging in the UK, giving a breakdown of how I think the costs associated with running a charging network explain the very high prices we're paying. However, that video leads to a natural question, one which several people asked in the comments. How can my assessment that we are not being ripped off possibly be accurate when Tesla charges so much less for supercharging? Well, let's see if we can answer that very question. How can Tesla possibly charge so much less than the other operators, and yet my figures still be right? Hello everyone, I'm Andrew. In that last video, we looked at the costs of building and running a DC rapid charging network, and my breakdown seemed to suggest that what we are being charged is not unreasonable. The charge point operators are not taking huge profits, in the way you might imagine without considering the detail of the costs incurred. After all, their prices are so much higher than home charging that it didn't seem possible that they are fair. I'll leave a link to that last video on the end screen and in the description. This one builds on that work, so you might want to watch that if you haven't already done so. There's a bit more detail in that one than there is in today's video. However, don't panic if you haven't seen that earlier one yet, this one should still make sense. What we can do today is follow the same process that we worked through last time, starting with the price that Tesla charge, take off what charges we can estimate, and see what's left. We need to start by choosing a single site to model, as we did last time. We need to do that to get an understanding of electricity connection charges, which form a part of the total costs, and vary by location. But when considering Tesla, there's actually a second reason we might need to do this, and that is that the prices they charge vary by site, so we need to choose what prices to use as an input to our calculations. Whilst investigating prices, I found this great site called Charge Insights, linked in the description, like all of the other sources in use today. This site offers a map of all of the Tesla supercharger locations and colour codes their prices. I thought I'd look for a green dot, one of the cheaper ones, to see if we could make sense of their especially low pricing, and while doing so, I spotted a couple of green dots in Leicester. Well, that was interesting because we talked about a site in Leicester in the last video, so it might make sense to compare to a site in a similar location this time. Well, I say a similar location, it turns out it's the same location. Entirely unbeknownst to me, that Tesco site I featured in the last one also has Tesla superchargers, just on the other side of the building. Well, that was just too good to be true, so we'll look at the Beaumont Lee superchargers today. Here's the site on the Tesla website, where we can see the facilities and prices. Looking at the prices shows we've got a bit more work to do when considering Tesla, because there are multiple prices. There's one set of prices for Tesla owners and members, and another set for non-Tesla owners, as this site is open to all EVs. Even better, we answer more questions at this site, just the ticket. The other complicating factor is that the prices vary by time of day, but while the website suggests there are four pricing bands, there's only actually two different prices, so that's not too difficult. Let's start with the peak price for Tesla owners, which we can see is 37 pence per kilowatt hour. You'll see why that one in a minute. Right, as last time, we start by removing the VAT, the tax that we pay on public charging in the UK, at a rate of 20%. That's 6.2 pence. If we take that off, we're left with 30.8 pence going to Tesla. The next thing we did last time was take off profit, assuming that profit would be a percentage of the costs of running the site. Let's do the same here, with a percentage of zero. I don't think Tesla tried to make any profit from supercharging for Tesla owners. The network was set up to ensure that Tesla owners had a good experience, that there was somewhere to charge, and not to milk them for all they are worth. Of course, I might be wrong in that assumption. We might find that the sums don't add up without profit, but let's go with it for now and see how we get on. So, no change after taking off the profit. We've still got 30.8 pence to explain. Next, we need to take electricity costs into account. We've got a reasonable chance of working those out from what we learned last time out. You may remember that Ian Johnston, the CEO of Osprey, 
told us that Osprey were paying 20 pence per kilowatt hour for electricity at the time of recording of the Everything Electric podcast that I referenced. That was recorded at the start of 2025. I don't see why we wouldn't reuse that at this time too. It's possible that Tesla might have been able to negotiate a slightly better price since they are somewhat bigger than Osprey, but let's run with it. And it's this useful bit of information that drove me to tackle the peak pricing first, because we've got a bit more information about the appropriate electricity costs for this time of day. So we'll go with 20 pence per kilowatt hour. I'll save you from any detail on the maths used to calculate connection charges. I worked them out using the information I gleaned for the last video and showed at a high level in that one. The Tesla superchargers at this site are more powerful than the Osprey chargers we considered last time. Furthermore, Tesla tried to deliver a premium experience and so I reckon they will have a bigger and better connection. That reduces the chance that cars are rate limited because of an overall site limit. As a result, I've estimated based on a connection of 1,500 kVA over twice the 675 kVA that we know Osprey have to their chargers. As a result, connection charges for Tesla are significantly higher than for Osprey. This is how that looks when we amortize those fees over the sessions at different utilization levels. By the way, Tesla's chargers are open 24 hours a day, unlike Osprey's. If we use the UK average utilization of 12.7% that we got from ZapMap data last time out, we're looking at a cost of more than four and a half pence per kilowatt hour. But is that the right figure to use? Is that Tesla's utilization? Well, fortuitously, Tesla tweeted the data we need to work that out in early July, which Tom Malogny's site, evchargingstations.com, highlighted for us. Globally, Tesla have a utilization of 16.7%, higher than the UK average across all operators. That's not all that much of a surprise to me. I did expect it to be higher than average. Because of the integration of charging into the navigation system and the integration of payment as well, Tesla owners are very likely to use superchargers. It's the simplest way for them by far. That's one of the benefits of getting a Tesla although the very high reliability helps too. Using this higher utilization brings down the cost per kilowatt hour to just 3.5 pence, the same as last time. Even though I think the total connection cost will be higher for Tesla, it gets amortized over quite a lot more sessions and the cost to the customer remains reasonable. So taking off the 20 pence per kilowatt hour for electricity and the three and a half pence for connection charges, we're left with 7.3 pence. The next thing we need to consider, and a significant part of what we pay for when using Osprey's chargers, is the build cost. What should we put for that? Well, I'm putting very little, just 5.3 pence, in comparison to 35 pence for Osprey. You think I'm mad, don't you? Don't worry, I haven't lost my marbles. I have multiple reasons for this. When we talked about Osprey, we said that the money to build a site comes from financing. They borrow the money and have to pay it back with interest. Tesla, meanwhile, don't borrow money. They have cash, at least these days, so there is no interest to be paid. No investors to appease by paying anything back by a specific date. No debt risk to be managed. I think they probably amortise the cost over 15 years. Furthermore, their build costs will likely be a bit lower as they build their own charging hardware, so no other company is taking profit from that. Not only do they build the hardware, they prefabricate it at the factory for the default installation they do, and that helps to lower the installation costs as well. There's a bit less work to do on site. Finally, we have to remember that they also have a higher utilization than the average, so when amortizing these costs, they get amortized across a higher number of sessions. What's more, because their prices are so much more reasonable, the number of kilowatt hours delivered in an average session is higher as well, so the costs are spread much further and wider. To be fair, this cash positive situation is true now. In the early days, it might have involved some debt, not to mention any government grants they could get access to, but that debt is long paid off these days. Okay, so with 5.3 pence put in for build costs, we're left with two pence, 
and that goes back into the coffers to pay the admin costs of running the network, paying for staffing to install and maintain them. Tesla has an advantage in maintenance as well though. They build their own kit to charge their own cars, and so they have managed to make it super reliable, which helps to minimise those maintenance costs. Their admin costs are lower than other operators for another reason as well. They aren't a standalone business. There is no CEO of charging, no CFO of charging, no separate finance or IT support teams. It takes a few extra people in those departments, I'm sure, but there's less overhead when you compare a part of a company who do many things to a whole company set up for a single business purpose with a single income stream. As it happens, we can also do a sense check. We've got two pence per kilowatt hour, and from those stats they gave us at the beginning of July, we know they do 45 million charging sessions per quarter and 35.5 kilowatt hours per session on average. Doing the appropriate multiplication and assuming it's the same across the world, we can see that they have an income of just under 128 million pounds with which they run a global charging network. We can see from the accounts that Osprey have administrative costs of 6.5 million pounds with which they run a charging company in a single country. Tesla have two superchargers in over 60 countries and multiplying these things together gives us a sense check that we're on the right track. Okay, so there's our breakdown for Tesla owners at peak times. We can now see the differences to Osprey. VAT is quite a lot lower because the total paid by the customer is lower. They take no profit from Tesla owners. Instead, they make their profit from selling other things and they haven't entered into any profit sharing with their landlords as the network wasn't intended to be profitable, I don't think. I've assumed that electricity costs are the same and connection charges end up being the same. Despite me reckoning that Tesla probably have more powerful connections, the costs get amortized over more sessions due to higher utilization. Build costs are recouped over a long time. That's a big part of the difference. And that's because Tesla don't need to borrow to finance the builds. Therefore, there is no deadline for recovering those upfront costs. They are able to recoup the build costs across a greater number of kilowatt hours, treating it more like a long-term investment. What remains after all those goes to covering the admin costs of running the network. However, they might have more efficient staffing, partially because they run networks in multiple countries, but mainly because the charging division are part of a bigger company, so there's less overhead in the hierarchy. Finally, they have lower maintenance costs. Because their charging is built in-house, it's a bit simpler because of integrated payment, and it's more reliable as a result. There are two bits I haven't covered thus far. First is landlord revenue. I haven't split site leasing costs out, but that's because the numbers pretty much wouldn't show. We don't know what they are for sure, but someone who applied to host a supercharger site did share some approximate figures at some point. It's not a lot of money. It would equate to less than 0.2 pence per kilowatt hour if we did split it out, so it didn't seem worth doing so. Next, there are two extra fees that can be incurred. Idle fees charged if you stay connected after charging ends and congestion fees charged when a site is busy and you charge above 80%. Those are both fines intended to drive behavior, that of a fair sharing of supercharger resources. Those are both 100% profit if charged, but the point is that they never should be if you play nicely. Right, so that's a fairly comprehensive breakdown of peak time price for Tesla owners. Let's quickly cover off the off-peak price. The process is exactly the same. VAT is a bit lower because the overall price charged is lower, two pence less. The bill costs, admin costs, and connection charges are the same. There is no reason why they would be different overnight. Therefore, I think we can see that Tesla must pay less for electricity in that overnight period. 10 pence per kilowatt hour less. I think that's the most likely reason for the price being different. We can probably keep it that simple. Let me know in the comments if you think of a reason for it being more complicated than that. Let's quickly cover the price charge to non-Tesla customers. First, the peak prices. VAT is higher, and I've allowed 1.5 pence per kilowatt hour for additional admin costs. 
In the UK, we require our charge point operators to have a 24-hour telephone support line, which I don't think existed before, at least not to the same extent. Tesla charging is very reliable, but that's a bit less true when car payments need to be taken. I can imagine there are more calls to the helpline from the public and more failures due to the payment reader, and I've reflected that as a separate line item to make it clear. What's left is profit, 11 pence per kilowatt hour, about 25% of the income after VAT. It seems only fair that Tesla earns profit from people who didn't buy their cars from them. It's the same sort of story with the off-peak prices for non-Tesla owners. The number in the profit line is smaller this time, but it still represents a 23% markup, not too shabby. So, at the start of the video, we wanted to see how it was possible for Tesla to do public charging so much cheaper than other operators. Could it be that I had my sums wrong last time out? Hopefully you can see that the cost difference isn't in conflict with my previous calculations. It doesn't disprove my hypothesis. Instead, it seems to largely confirm it, all in all. Tesla is a totally different beast to Osprey. Rather than being a company set up solely for the single purpose of charging, the supercharger network is just one part of the business. That could bring down admin costs. Their reliability is high, helping to keep maintenance costs under control as well, and their build costs are also reduced because they build their own charging hardware, another example of their vertical integration. Because they make their money elsewhere, they don't need to make a profit from Tesla owners, the network wasn't really set up with that in mind, in my opinion. As a result, it made little sense to enter into profit sharing agreements with their landlords, and instead landlords get steady, predetermined income. It's not a gamble to be a landlord for Tesla superchargers. But by far the biggest difference is that they have cash to spare from selling other things. As a result, they don't need to borrow money to build sites, or pay it back to an investor's deadline. That means they can amortise the build costs over a longer period and more sessions. Their higher utilisation also helps to make it less significant a part of what people pay, another benefit they have from building a whole ecosystem rather than a standalone charging network. The latest development is that they can now open some of their sites to the public, those where wait times won't get out of control by doing so. From the public, they do take a profit, and a healthy one at that, if my assumptions are correct. So what do you think? Do you reckon this breakdown makes sense alongside last week's? I'd love to hear your thoughts in the comments. What do you think I got wrong this time, if anything? Let me have it down in that section. If you've liked this week's video, then it will be a huge help to me if you click the thumbs up button. And I'd love to have you as a subscriber if you want to see more from me. Thanks.